introduce uh, Dr. Mahmoud, uh, our speaker this morning. Dr. Mahmoud is an assistant professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School and the Division of Computational Pathology at Brigham Women Hospital. He's also a member of the Cancer Data Science Program at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute and an associate member of the Broad Institute of Harvard at MIT. He received his PhD in Biomedical Imaging at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Japan and completed uh, a postdoctoral fellowship in Biomedical Engineering at the Johns Hopkins University. Welcome, Dr. Mahmoud. Thank you so much for inviting me and thank you so much for the uh, for the introduction. <clears throat> so uh, today I'll be talking about uh, artificial intelligence driven uh, computational pathology. So just to make sure that everyone can see my screen, can someone write that? Okay, okay, thanks. Um, uh, okay, so uh, just to... Um, Okay, so I I, th I think the group of group of people here today don't need any introduction about artificial intelligence and how it's really poised to change medical imaging and medical image analysis as well as healthcare in general. Um, but I'm just going to go over some of the fundamental questions that we uh, are trying to answer in my uh, in my lab and uh, what my students are kind of working on. So we're, we're very interested in in trying to uh, see if AI can enhance cancer diagnosis, and this is kind of an obvious, uh, there's an obvious answer to this is yes, that this, this is possible. And we've seen it in a number of different uh, large scale studies now. Um, but we want to go a step further and see that can we develop uh, AI solutions that are effective using limited data so we can work with rare conditions and uh, really generalize these problems that, uh, that, that, that the, the solutions that have been solved for uh, large scale problems to, 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 to situations where you might have uh, much, much, much limited data. For example, clinical trials where you might want to predict uh, whether the next patient is going to respond to a particular therapy or not. And um, can we predict things like patient uh, outcomes, survival outcomes? Uh, can we identify new morphological features and biomarkers that are of prognostic and diagnostic relevance? Uh, this is a question that's very interesting for, for pathology. Um, and then finally, can we predict response to specific therapeutic agents? And uh, this is something I really, really like showing. This is a poem from Judith, who's a uh, um, who wrote this in 1979. She's a, she's a very well-known um, um, researcher in the area of, uh, of, of uh, pathology image analysis. She started doing this in, in, in the 60s when no one else was, was thinking about this. And one, one uh, thing that she particularly writes here is that artificial intelligence is another craze uh, that uses computers to cope with the diagnostic maze. Though criteria for intelligence has never been resolved, paper after paper, claims that the problem has already been solved. Um, so uh, I find it very interesting that this, uh, this, this written in 1979 is still very, very true today. Uh, the pace at which uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in general is being used is much, uh, much higher now because we have much more computing power, much more availability of data, and just the ability to store more, more data. Um, but this is very true that uh, we, we see time and time again uh, claims where uh, that a particular problem has been resolved, whereas when you move it to the field, uh, it, it becomes uh, more and more difficult and challenging. Um, so just to give a, a small overview of what deep learning, deep learning is and how it's different from uh, classical machine learning and why it's really interesting to be uh, working in this area now, is that machine learning, classical machine learning has always required feature extraction. So if you want to model uh, a table or a chair, you would want to model the edges and corners that, rep that are representative of that. Uh, of, of, of that image, uh, whereas what deep learning allows you to do is that, is that it takes away the manual feature extraction part. It, 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 it lets you use images and labels corresponding those images without having to uh, have someone manually go in and, and mathematically model a particular feature for, uh, for everything. And this, uh, has, this has really accelerated uh, the process of, of using um, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence tools. 
Um, so typical uh, deep learning diagnostic workflow, workflow involves detection, localization, segmentation, and characterization, but what, what it really uh, lacks is, is addition of other information like familial history, patient history, um, and information from multimodal data, data sources. Uh, as we all know, uh, this group knows better than anyone else that, that, that diagnosis these days is, is multimodal and relies on information coming in from many different sources, including uh, images, different modalities, molecular information. Um, and uh, really some of these modern tools lack the ability to integrate information from multiple, multiple sources. So uh, I'm sure quite a lot of people in this group are already familiar with this, but just to give a little bit of a background on how these AI uh, systems uh, or deep learning models are trained, these basically, these systems are trained uh, by using an input and a ground truth corresponding that input. And this input can be an image and the ground truth can be a, a diagnosis. And in the beginning, when this system starts training or starts learning, it knows nothing. So uh, an output might come from, um, from, from, from pretty much uh, uh, anything. It could just be basically garbage. And then there's a comparison that's made between that output and the ground truth. And based off of that comparison, you modify your AI system and you repeat this workflow over and over again until you have a model that's really representative of, of, of your data. So one thing that I should, I should mention here is that why is this so, so interesting? This is very interesting because this setup lets you establish uh, nonlinear relationships between an input and, uh, and an output. So things that can be perfectly mathematically modeled don't require the use of deep learning or, or artificial intelligence systems to, uh, to, to, for, for, for us to get a model out of them. They can just be mathematically models. This, this setup is very interesting for problems where you don't have a direct connection between an input and an output, or it's, it's just so hard to manually model it. Uh, that you can rely on this kind of data-driven uh, modeling. Um, and uh, just to give a little bit of an overview of what, what my lab is, uh, is interested in and what the general computational pathology community is, is kind of moving towards is that we have a lot of phenotypic data and this data can come from, from H&Es, IHCs, or, or multiplex aminofluorescence. Um, and we're very interested in uh, quantitative spatial analysis. So we're interested in quantifying the tissue microenvironment and, and understanding what's going on in the microenvironment and also classifying everything that is uh, on, on, on a slide level, on, on a patch level, or, an, or, on, or on, an, on an ROI, origin of interest level. And we're trying to do this to get to this, uh, this, this kind of an outcome. We're trying to do early diagnosis, prognosis, therapeutic response prediction, um, patient stratification, and integrative biomarker discovery. Uh, but on the other hand, we already have this large quantitative field of, of uh, molecular pathology where we have, have well-established molecular markers that can, that can come from genomic, transcriptomic, and increasingly from proteomic and metabolomic uh, information. And we want to put all of those together and have like an integrative uh, deep learning environment which can fuse information from multiple, multiple sources and, uh, um, and, and let us do the integrative clinical outcomes that I have, I have over here. But we're also very interested in establishing correspondences between uh, phenotypic and multi-omic uh, data and trying to see how what relates with what. However, to do all of this, there are a lot of technical challenges that need to be addressed um, until we get to this, uh, to a point where we can really start integrating this on, on a larger scale and implementing these tools with, uh, with, with multiple disease models. So I'll talk a little bit about these technical challenges uh, and explain each one of them uh, in, 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 in layman terms and in, in, in some detail that so everyone can understand. So it's, it's uh, first of all, limited annotated data. So we have limited data available for training most of these models. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit in, in more detail about this later in the talk. Um, the, uh, the, the consensus is that pathology definitely has more data than, than radiology. It's often not digitized and uh, is, uh, it, it requires some, some processing. It's, it's often unstructured. Um, but, uh, but the issue is that most of this data is, is unlabeled. So labels might only exist on the slide level because diagnosis is made on the slide level and would not exist on, 
uh, on, on the tissue level. Um, there, there is a recent work uh, where, where you can transfer knowledge from, um, from, from, from existing deep learning pipelines uh, that have been trained in, on, on real world uh, images to, uh, to, to medical imaging and it's just great, gaining like increasing, uh, increasing attention. I'll talk more about this later in the talk, talk as well. Then there are issues with domain adaptation where you train on data that looks like this and you test on data that looks something like this and there would be uh, issues in adaptability on models that are trained on data from one institution uh, and the differences can, can come from small, small changes. For example, maybe they source their stains from a different vendor or they just use a different scanner to, uh, to scan their, their images. Uh, so the question really here is that can we train AI systems that are robust enough to variability in data sources? Um, the third problem is structured prediction. The, the, the pathology slides are typically very, very large, could can have up to a billion pixels. Um, a, a lot of the methods rely by patching these slides up. So because these methods work on a patch level, the algorithm, the trained model might not be aware of what's going on at a distant region uh, in the image uh, like a pathologist uh, would be. So this can lead to errors. Uh, so is there, is there a mechanism that we can, we, can, we can develop methods that are really more context aware and are aware of, uh, of, of the entire, entire slide rather than just a region within the slide? The fourth one is very interesting and a lot of people are interested in this area these days that how can we integrate information from, um, from histology and from molecular features and uh, integrating this information has obviously enormous potential in, in doing all of these integrative, integrative, integrative clinical outcomes that I mentioned. Um, but data fusion is a, is a very difficult uh, and an open research problem. There are journals that are named data fusion and it's uh, uh, it's, it's just a, a difficult problem and this really requires dedicated solutions that are meant for combining histology and molecular features. Um, and, and just to uh, go in a little bit deeper, how large are pathology slides for the, and I know there are a lot of people joining us today who, uh, who don't come from the pathology uh, community. Uh, the, these slides, once they're digitized, these can be as large as 100,000 by 100,000 to modern scanners. It can be even 200,000 by 200,000 uh, pixels. These are like satellite images. These are enormously large. And if you compare this with the largest data set that comes from real world images, this image net has about three trillion pixels. Each, each image is about 450 by 400 pixels and it has 20,000 uh, classes. Um, this, this incredibly large data set of real world images has the same number of pixels in about 500 slides. So 14 million real world images are, are equal to about 500 slides. So this, is, this really describes the scale of data Pathology, pathology data once it's digitized and stored, what, what it's like. And, and, and this is just to motivate that it requires dedicated solutions um, when, when dealing with, this, uh, with, with these data sets. Um, this, is like, this is a nice infographic that uh, one, of my, uh, one of my postdocs created, uh, just to explain the, 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 the categories of these, these methods and these algorithms. Um, I wouldn't go into the technical details, but the, this presentation will be available later for people who are interested in, uh, in, in going back and looking at these methods. So the, the, the methods can really be, be, be separated into three categories or sup supervised methods uh, where you have um, where you're either manually extracting features on a slide level or you have pixel level labels. Um, the issue with this is that this is very time consuming and tedious and someone has to go in and really annotate these, these slides. Um, the second class of algorithms that we as a group feel that are very, very uh, interesting and applicable to, uh, to, to computational pathology are weakly supervised methods where we only have slide level labels. Uh, and this is much more clo close, closer to the diagnostic, uh, the, the re real world diagnostic situation where pathologists are assigning diagnosis on the, on the level of a slide and not, not on the level of uh, pixels or patches where they, where they go in and, and, and annotate things. Uh, pathology reports typically have slide level diagnoses. So if, if we can uh, come up with methods that really allow us to train artificial intelligence models on a slide level, uh, using what we already have clinically, um, that would be uh, a major uh, uh, 
that, that would really enable computational pathology uh, towards uh, uh, being used in the clinic much more as compared to uh, something that requires pixel level annotation and is just te tedious to curate. So we have been really focused on developing uh, weekly supervised methods. And I'll explain one of those methods in detail today. Um, and then there's a final class of methods that's, uh, those that are unsupervised and have, for which you have no labels at all. And these could be for rare conditions where you don't know where there, where there are not established protocols of what, what morphological features uh, might represent a particular disease or it's a new disease and and you can go in and, uh, and and try to find common morphology across patients by using these methods these are unsupervised or self-supervised methods um, so a typical uh, deep learning for pathology image analysis workflow over the past um, seven or eight years has been that you, you have this slide that has a billion pixels and you chop it up into smaller patches or, or origins of interest and someone typically goes in and extracts out origin of interest and it's, it's patched further. Those patches are assigned labels of benign or malignant or whatever subtype you're, you're trying to classify. And using that, you will have um, a convolutional neural, neural network that's trained to get a heat map that looks something like this. Um, and this, this acts as a proof of concept that uh, deep learning is capable of, of diagnosis and prognosis. Um, now, this, this is a, a, the, the proof of concept is great. However, it does require region of interest extraction. Is, this, this is really not practical in a real world situation uh, where you want to give uh, pathologists an assistive tool that really works on the whole slide level. Um, and uh, this, this pipeline really works with anything that you might have uh, a ground truth label for. If you have survival labels, you can predict survival from whole slide images. And then there's some recent work on interpretability where you can look at grading class activation maps and find the regions that are being used to make those classification determinations. And this could lead to morphological uh, feature discovery. Um, um, however, this proof of concept is really based on a whole, uh, based on regions of interest or, or, or on patches. The, the question that we really wanted to answer and we've been working on over the past year is that can we do this uh, just with slide level labels? And the answer is that yes, there is some recent work showing that you can do this on, on slide level labels. However, when you do that, each whole slide image becomes a single data point. So this means that you need tens of thousands of slides to uh, to train these methods, which is just tedious and might not be, uh, that, that amount of data might not be available for particular disease models. And especially the most interesting cases, which, which we're interested in in, in in research and not as a commercial entity, uh, for example, trying to find out which patients would respond to particular particular treatments or, or looking at this for, for really rare conditions. Um, so, to, so to just to sum up everything, because I've given a lot of information in a very, very short amount of time, to sum up, to, to sum up everything, whatever whole slide processing, AI for pathology, whole, whole slide processing wish list would be, is that we, we want something that works without extracting ROIs, without having someone sit there and point us to what the most interesting region is in this gigapixel image. Um, without requiring any pre-processing steps like stain normalization and without uh, having to uh, do, do, uh, do time-consuming pixel level annotation uh, without requiring thousands of slides. So this paradox between uh, requiring tens of thousands of images and uh, requiring pixel level labels, uh, we really have to break this paradox to, to really bring this to a, a more clinical setting. Um, and then adaptable to data from multiple sources. So if you train on data from one source, it should be adaptable to, to data from, from, from other sources. And it has to be computationally efficient. And uh, finally, it has to be easy to use. Um, so this is a workflow that uh, one of my uh, students uh, um, along working with a, with, with a couple of residents we came, we came up with. So we start with uh, whole slide images. We start by segmenting out the, uh, out the tissue. Once the tissue is segmented, we patch the, we patch the tissue and we, have, we, we end up with patches like this. We use these patches and extract features from these patches and, and we, we try to predict uh, using a deep learning based paradigm and what the most interesting regions uh, are within that uh, with, uh, from those patches. And, 
then we cluster them. So we, we, we have a clustering paradigm where we, where we try to cluster the, uh, the, the similar patches together, and this enforces an additional constraint on the classification problem. And in the end, we end up with heat maps like this and uh, a determination of what the, uh, what, what, what the diagnosis is on, on a whole slide level. Um, and uh, to really validate this, uh, we, we came up with the study design where we had three different data sets and for a variety of different reasons, variety of different reasons we used this. We used renal cell carcinoma, non-small cell lung cancer, and lymph node metastases because they represent different, different problems. Um, and uh, we analyzed for each one of these how data efficient uh, this method is by decreasing the amount of data that was required for training. Um, and then we adapted the, the, the models that came from this, uh, the, this training setup to different sites, to different imaging devices. So the first problem we looked at was renal cell carcinoma subtyping. We used data from, uh, from the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas. This is, these are public, publicly available whole slide images. We used about 884 whole slide images for training and validation and adapted this to independent test cohort that came from the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, th this is what the results look like um, in, in a cross-validation uh, scenario. We, we had AUCs of 0 0.991, uh, very, very, uh, very, very, very predictive model. Um, when we did some uh, data efficiency analysis, we saw that as we go from using 710 slides to using just 70 slides, there is a decrease in performance. But the decrease, e even with the decreased uh, decreased number of training data, the the, the AUC was still still re reasonable. Really acting as a proof of concept that we can use limited uh, number of slides for for training. Um, these are the results when we adapt this model to data from, from the Brigham. So you can see the AUC is around 0 0.973. When we use 100 percent of training labels, that, that's about 710 slides. But when we drop it to 50 percent of training labels, that's 347 slides, we still have an AUC of 0 0.946. So this, this really is a proof of concept that if you have a situation where you're trying to predict response from treatment where you only might, uh, you, where you only might have a few hundred patients, uh, or as few as 10 or, or, or as few as 70 patients. We can train a model that would still be predictive of this, uh, uh, of, of, of the outcome. But we also saw that as we moved to, di to, to, to different disease models, we had uh, varying performance. So, the, so, so because this method uses attention, attention is, is, is something that we can quantify and look at what regions of the image were being used while making that, that classification determination. So we can really localize the regions that the, that the, that the trained model is looking at to make that determination. Um, and when we, uh, when we compared what a pathologist would look at to make a, make a determination that this is papillary renal cell carcinoma, it really corresponds to what the model is looking at. And the model never used any pixel level annotation um, during training. So all, all we feed into the model is, is whole slide images and corresponding uh, uh, slide level labels. Um, we have this demo that I, I, I can show in a while and if people are interested, they can go in uh, and, and, and look at this uh, on, on a whole slide level. Um, and we really analyzed what, what regions uh, the model was using and it corresponds with, with, uh, with morphology that's typically, typically used to, uh, to make this diagnosis. And, and similarly for renal clear cell carcinoma, we looked at the high attention regions and what, what a pathologist would typically look at, what the, what, what the algorithm is looking at, and really analyze what the morphology was. And it corresponded with morphology that would typically be used while no pixel level annotation was ever used for making that determination. Um, this is just a third, third subtype for chromophobe. Um, and then to really analyze uh, what's going on, we, we, we had some further interpretability set up where we looked at the clusters uh, that were created. So for renal cell carcinoma, we saw that for the three class uh, subtyping problem, uh, similar morphology was really clustered together for clear cell, papillary, and for, uh, and for chromophobe. Um, and then we repeated this entire flow for uh, non-small cell lung cancer as a, as a second 
as, as, as a sec second problem that we wanted to to see how this this method really works on, and we used data uh, from the from the TCGA and CPTAC, close to 2,000 slides for for training, and uh, then this was uh, tested on an independent test cohort from the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, with 131 whole slide. Uh, images and we have a uh, have a similar uh, uh, performance uh, with this. The cross validation the UCs are about 0.956, and the performance does become worse uh, worse as you decrease the amount of data used for training. But it's, it it remains reasonable until about 25 percent of the uh, of the labels are used. Um, and we we showed that you can train this model on the TCGA and adapt it to the data uh, that comes from in in house. Uh, slides here at the Brigham um, and we were able to get similar heat maps where the, the region that a pathologist would typically use corresponds uh, with the region that the model is, is using and clustering for further revealed uh, that the model is looking at the correct region. So the, the, the purple region here corresponds with adenocarcinoma, the green region is squamous cell, and the agnostic region is everything else in the slide that's just background or garbage or normal uh, tissue. Um, and then the, the, the third case, we, we tried this with uh, breast cancer, lymph node metastases, uh, and the reason to do this is that we wanted to see that how it works in a problem where we're really looking at, uh, at a needle in a haystack. Um, and the training uh, set was using the, the well-known challenges from Chameleon 16 and 17, and was adapted to in-house data from the Brigham, Brigham again. Um, and uh, the, there is a decrease in performance when we go from, uh, for, from primary diagnosis to, to, to uh, metastases. Uh, the, the AUCs was about 0 0.953 when, uh, when we were cross-validating this, and it was about 0 0.934 uh, on the independent uh, test cohort. And we looked at the, the heat maps and it corresponds to those regions. And uh, just to show a little bit, so, so this, is the, this is the demo. Um, you can go in and have a look at this on a, on, a, on a whole slide level. This, for example, this is renal cell carcinoma as patient one. The ground truth is papillary and the prediction is papillary and the confidence of the model is 0 0.99. So the model is about 99% confident that this is papillary uh, renal cell carcinoma. And you can zoom in and look at the Look at the regions that it that it used to make that determination, um, and it corresponds with, uh, with with morphology that that's typically used. Um, and we we did this uh, with, uh, with with a number of different cases. This is this is clear cell. Um, you can go in and look at look at what the morphology uh, the the deep learning model is using, um, and how it corresponds with typical uh, typical morphology that's used. And you can do this for non-small cell lung cancer. So I think this is a, a deno case. Um, and uh, the, the model confidence is again like about 99%. Um, and you can look at this in a variety of different uh, variety of different ways. The, I've put the link uh, in the slides, which I think will be available. So if people uh, want to go in and have a look at how, how attention basically works uh, and how it can really be used as an assistive tool for um, for pathologists to to guide uh, if they're if they're missing a region or um, to, to to really help them uh, make, make make the speedier diagnoses and we're in the in, in the process of um, of trying to implement something like this in, in a more clinical situation um, right now. Okay, so to go back, um, so to to further validate how well uh, this this pipeline is really working, we took this. This is a whole slide image, and we get an attention map out of it. An attention map really dictates the region, where the, what the algorithm or the trained model is using. And then we have A1, A3, uh, the, the pan keratin uh, stain that's typically used for uh, breast cancer metastases. And we zoom into this region, and we, we look at the, this is the whole slide image, this is the attention map, and this is A1, A3 to, to see, um, really tr try to validate how well it's actually working. Um, and looking at particular regions and, and where where the attention is and um, how well it corresponds to like a subsequent slice that came that was stained with A1A3 and the the real uh, benefit of this pipeline is that it's it's very very easy to use um, so it, it does not require any pixel level annotation during training does not require any RO, ROI extraction 
There's no pre-processing involved. It's interpretable and you get these whole slide level heat, uh, heat maps and attention maps and it tells you what regimes the algorithm used to make, the, uh, make these determinations. And it's also data efficient. So you can use for a few hundred to a few thousand slides to, uh, to train efficient models. Um, but to go uh, like re really a step further, uh, we, we wanted to see that can this pipeline that was trained on whole slide images now adapt to uh, cell phone microscopy images. So this is a typical way uh, people like to take images of, uh, of, of their favorite cases and uh, this, this is also a setup that's, that's used quite a lot in, in telepathology and people take, uh, take images like these and uh, they, um, they post them on social media to, do, to, to see if, if someone would would give them an accurate diagnosis of challenging cases. We uh, we trained uh, uh, we, we we tried to see if this uh, these models would really adapt to, uh, to 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 images that are taken with a cell phone. And the benefit of doing this is that the whole slide image really covers a much more uh, much much larger field of view than um, a, a, a cell phone image can cover. So we repeated this, uh, this flow, uh, we, we, we took the, the exact same models and we took the exact same slides and imaged them with a cell phone. We saw that there was a decrease in performance, uh, but the performance was still reasonable. The ACs were 0 0.873 on non-small cell lung cancer subtyping and 0 0.912 on renal cell carcinoma subtyping. So definitely a decrease in performance, but, uh, but this is still reasonable and, and this can, can, can also be embedded like a cell phone app and can be used in low resource settings where they might not have uh, someone available to make, a, make an immediate diagnosis. Um, and we looked at the heat maps and the, and the, and the, the PCA separation plots to, to see how well it was working on a, on, on a whole slide level. And we can, we can also make use of these attention maps or heat maps. We also saw that, uh, we also realized that in, in, in cases where the, the model was making incorrect predictions, the, the confidence was lower and the heat map was still uh, attending to the regions that would be diagnostic and, and be used for, um, for, for, for cancer determination. Um, and uh, as like a further secondary experiment, we, we, we adapted uh, these models that were trained on whole slide images to, to biopsies. So, um, the, the resections hold, uh, really cover a much larger uh, tissue uh, tissue area on the uh, on the slide as compared to biopsies. So if you're training with biopsies, you can train with ten thousand or fifteen thousand biopsies, and it, it would really have the same number of uh, of patches or tissue coverage as thousand to fifteen hundred resections would. So it really makes sense to to train on whole slide images and adapt them to. Uh, uh, to biopsy, so we, so we saw that this this model is adaptable. Uh, however, the performance was not as high as as we would have wanted it to be. But but the the UCs are still uh, still reasonable. It's beyond zero point nine for both non small cell lung cancer subtyping and for renal cell carcinoma subtyping. So uh, if you look at the demo, if you're going back and looking at the demo, you'll you'll find uh, we do have cases in there that you can look at are, that come from biopsies and. Uh, the regions that it's using to make those classification determinations. Um, and uh, the interactive demo is available here. All the code for this is, uh, is very easy to use. Um, we have some collaborators who are having success in, 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 in using it. Uh, it's available on our lab, uh, lab GitHub. So if you would just like to have a look at the code or try it out yourself, uh, please feel free and please uh, get in touch. Um, if you if you have any issues with using it, um, before I move on, uh, I, I would just like to talk a little bit more about uh, limited data uh, and quantifying the tissue uh, tissue microenvironment. Um, so uh, the, the the way I just explained of dealing with limited data is is kind of the state of the art. But some work that we've done previously is is that we the, the, these deep learning models don't don't typically require um, any um, and, and any feature level information to, uh, to to be trained, but we do have a lot of uh, information about these um, um, about, about the diagnosis of, of these particular cases. So, so is the, the question we really wanted to answer is that is there a way for us to incorporate existing knowledge into these deep deep networks to really enhance the the, the diagnostic ability or, or the system ability of these methods while still using limited data. So, so we use this case for, for breast cancer grading where we, 
we, we typically look at things like nuclear tip tubule formation and, and mitotic activity. And instead of just having a single deep network uh, predict the, the grade from the, uh, the histology slide, we, we, we had three separate networks perform these individual tasks and then we combined them to make an overall diagnosis. And we, we saw that this, this works particularly well. Um, to do this, we, we trained individual networks to do these tasks. We started with nuclei segmentation. Nuclei segmentation is, it's a, it's a very old problem. It's been, it's been tackled quite a lot. Um, however, we did see that uh, there are limited methods that perform exhaustively well on, uh, on h and &E images, regardless of, uh, of, of tissue type. So we started with a small data set of 32,000 by 1,000 uh, um, um, extracted ROIs from whole slide images uh, that, that had manual nuclei segmentation information. Um, however, uh, this was not enough, of da enough data to train something that would really be exhaustive enough to, to adapt to multiple organs. So we, so we stay normalized these to really uh, unify what, the, what, 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 they, what they really look like. And we generated a lot of synthetic data. So this uh, synthetic data generation is a, is a very interesting uh, area in computational pathology right now where you can generate images that are essentially fake, uh, but can, uh, they don't look like real tissue, but they can be assistive in uh, solving a particular task. Um, for example, uh, in, in this task, we're trying to segment the nuclei very, very accurately. So we don't care what the synthetic data essentially looks like as long as it helps us train a model that would really uh, accurately segment nuclei on a whole slide level. Um, so this is a paradigm if someone wants to go in and, and look at this data, but we used a, a dual generative adversarial network-based paradigm to generate a lot of synthetic data. This is all, uh, all synthetic data, and we have corresponding uh, labels uh, with this. The goal here is not to generate accurate morphology, but to generate a data set that would then train a model that can uh, very accurately segment out uh, a nuclei, and that's what we're trying to trying to do here using generative adversarial network. So this, uh, after applying this network, we we get very accurate nuclei segmentation on on, on multiple multiple organs. Um, we do have code and everything available for this if, if people would like to use it. But this paradigm of generating synthetic data for an intermediate task and using that for for training also works in other situations. For example, looking at uh, mitotic event detection. Um, and the real reason why we were really segmenting out these nuclei was to do something that's called a graph convolutional uh, network. So we have, uh, uh, in, in this case, we have a, have a prostate TMA core and we want to predict whether it's high risk or low risk and what the Gleason score is. We segment out all the nuclei, we build a graph uh, of the nuclei to, to really capture the, the structural information that exists there. Uh, and then we extract features from the regions surrounding the, uh, the, the, the nuclei or the, uh, or the textural, textural features or uh, self-supervised features, really deep, deep features that correspond to the region around the, the, uh, the nuclei. And um, using that, the, we, we build a graph representation and use graph convolutional networks. So this is a deep network or, a, or an or a artificial intelligence model that works on the level of the graph rather than working on the whole slide. So this, this also has a compressive ability of, of, uh, of letting us use uh, much less parameters and still being able to, tr to train on a, on, on a whole TMA or a whole, uh, whole slide level. Um, we showed that the performance with graph convolutional networks was uh, was better than than using uh, uh, other uh, other other kinds of features. Um, there's a preprint about this if people would like to go in and, and learn more about uh, about this. Um, we use this with some some challenging uh, um, predictions. For example, predicting IDH mutation from gliomas uh, on. Uh, in a, for, 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 from these ROIs, we saw that we can make uh, predictions that are fairly accurate, AUCs of 0 0.88. This might not be good enough as, as having actual molecular, molecular testing, but uh, it can be used in low resource settings where molecular testing might not be available, um, and, uh, or, or uh, IHC might not be available. To, so we did, we did the same with, with predicting ERPR status for, uh, uh, for breast cancer and had um, uh, relatively reasonable AUCs over 0 0.8 that can again be used in low resource settings where IHC might not be available. 
Um, and this is something I really like to show just to, just to uh, give an idea of, uh, of why uh, this, is, uh, this is interesting. So, so this is a case, this is uh, colon cancer, where we have a graph built on, on, on the nuclei. Uh, and this is a positive, positive case. Uh, this is a negative uh, uh, case. And then you can see how the glands uh, are represented in the graph. So the, the graph really captures the topology uh, on, and the morphology while still uh, being like a compressive form of the, of the slide. So we're, we're not just using the, the graph itself, the graph really is representative of the features uh, that come from each one of those nodes. Um, and then we tried this on a whole slide level where we build a patch graph uh, instead of a nuclear graph. The patch graph really helps us capture a much larger region of the, uh, of the slide. This, uh, this was for pancreatic uh, cancer and we were able to get similar heat maps like I showed, showed earlier. Uh, this is again a weekly supervised paradigm where we only need the whole slide image and the corresponding ground truth label to do this. Um, this is uh, a, a color, this is the same thing repeated with uh, colorectal cancer, where we can identify what what regions uh, are, are 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 being used to make those classification determinations. Um, so uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, incorporating multimodal information or incorporating information from multiple sources. I do know that we have limited time, so I'm just going to go through this quickly. So we have enough time for uh, for questions. Um, so this is some work one of my uh, graduate students has uh, has done. Um, so we, we call this method pathomic fusion, where we're trying to integrate information in an, in an intuitive manner from histology and uh, genomic features. Um, and the hope is that we would do this for a better diagnosis and, and prognosis. So we have molecular profiles. Uh, these have, uh, have, have mutations uh, and uh, transcriptomic information. And then on the other hand, we have, have histology we, and we want to find a method to, to integrate the two. The typical approach that uh, has been used is that you, you, you extract features from both, both of these modalities and you concatenate them. Um, however, this is really a, not, not a very intuitive way to fuse information from these, from these sources because these are, these are inherently different. Um, so on, on, and, and uh, this uh, kind of CNN model also, uh, we, we don't know whether it, it captures information from, uh, that's, that's essentially spatially distant. Um, so we also use graph convolutional networks for this as an additional modality. Um, and the, the solution that, the, that, uh, that Richard, the, my, my student came up with, uh, is that we can use something called tensor fusion, where we fuse information from all three of these sources as a, as a multimodal tensor and take the chronicler product of the three, um, and then train this end to end um, to do a better diagnosis and prognosis. How, however, one thing we found that just by doing this, each one of these modalities didn't really project onto one another. Um, so we used, so this is just showing the, uh, the, the graph convolutional network uh, set up, um, how we can build the graph by segmenting the nuclei and um, extracting the features and then using graph convolutional networks. Um, so uh, what, we, what we really realized was that each one of these modalities does not project onto uh, uh, one another and is not representative of, of, of the information that comes from each one of these modalities. So we use something called attention gating where we project one modality onto the other, forcing it to use the most important content from each one of these uh, modalities. And then we tried this with, by integrating the glioma and lower grade glioma cohorts from the, uh, from the TCGA. Um, and we did this for, for grading and grade, grade prediction uh, and also for survival prediction. And we, we saw that it's, uh, that, that atomic fusion is, is capable of, uh, of separating the, the cases into distinct, uh, distinct groups. And uh, the C index on survival for the crude overall survival prediction uh, was about 6.31% higher than just using histology, which is also very predictive of survival. Um, we did some further analysis. Uh, the, 
the, the hazard curves here really show patients that, that survive less than five years uh, um, as red and those who survive greater than five years as, as blue. And if we use just histology, uh, it's, the hazard is kind of spread out, whereas if you use both histology and genomic information fused together, we have, uh, it forms distinct peaks, and we did some further analysis on what these peaks are. If, if people are interested, um, we, we, we have a preprint about this. Um, and uh, we, we, we show that pathomic fusion kind of adheres to the, to the World Health Organization status, uh, standard um, slightly better than uh, just using genomic information. Um, and the, the code for this is available so that the paradigm for multimodal fusion is really general. So if you, if you have uh, data from, uh, from a variety of different sources, you can integrate it. Um, and the preprint for this is also available. So uh, please try to use this uh, tool in your research. And if you have any issues, please let us know. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's about it. I think we have time, sufficient time for, uh, for questions. If you have any, um, any, any particular technical questions about this, feel free to email me. We usually post all lab announcements over Twitter. So uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll take questions. So thank you, Mahmoud, uh, uh, for uh, the wonderful presentation. Uh, and uh, let's see if uh, there are any questions for the, from the audience. Yeah, so I've got, I've got a question. Mm -hmm. um, so when you were looking at your accuracy, I noticed that you have highly imbalanced classes. Is, is mm -hmm. your accuracy just um, predicting the dominant class and therefore it's always going to have a, a high quote unquote accuracy or was that the per class accuracy? So the, uh, the AUCs that were showed there, they were macro averaged, right? So, uh, but we also have per class uh, uh, accuracies and per class AUCs available in the, in the preprint. So the accuracy, uh, accuracy is reasonable across the, uh, uh, across the classes, we made sure of that, yeah. What kind of memory and tensor core usage typically are needed for uh, post light imaging chaining and uh, uh, inference? Okay, so so uh, the way the, the the method I presented is structured, you can uh, you can use um, NVIDIA twenty eighty Ti. Typically, use GPUs. Uh, these are GPUs that are created for for gaming, but we use them for 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 training. It's uh, it's common among the deep, deep learning community to use those. Um, we have local workstations with four, four of those GPUs each, and we have several workstations. But, but for, um, for, for, because this work really involved training a lot of models and comparing them, we also used Google Cloud for this. Um, yeah, so, so we, you, the, the, the short answer is that you can use a consumer grade workstation that's typically used for gaming to train these. And then there was another question. Um, is the uh, AUC accounting for the highly imbalanced classes? Yeah, I, 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 I just answered that. So, so, so we use macro average uh, AUC, but we do have individual uh, AUCs as well. So, so the, the, the classes for uh, the non-small cell lung cancer subtyping were reasonably balanced. Uh, the classes for renal cell carcinoma subtyping are, are not balanced. Uh, because a chromophobe is uh, is rare, um, but we do get reasonable accuracy on those. So our, our test set, our test set does have a balance. So I, our, our test set uh, that for, from the Brigham for which we were reporting the accuracy, we have uh, 46 uh, cases of uh, renal clear cell carcinoma, 43 from the uh, from papillary, and 43 from chromophobe. Uh and then another one, the pipeline uses clustering. Will that not use the context of the patch? Uh, is, uh, uh, so what is your... Uh, oh, yeah, so, so, so it, definitely, absolutely. So, so, so uh, the, the, the pipeline that we have is, you, you can get these attention maps from them, but it's definitely not context aware. So we are working on uh, con context aware versions of this where we use multi-resolution or multi-magnification information. Uh, the clustering definitely does lose the, uh, the context. However, the, uh, the clustering itself does not uh, lead to the 
classification determination. The question just imposes an additional constraint on the on on the classification problem. All right, so we still have uh, little time left. So let's uh, go to the next one. Uh, in adapting the model for cell phone microscopy, was any image augmentation implemented? It seems that major difference in the field of view captured is reduced as compared to whole mount images. Could augmentation such as random cropping and rotation be a way to simulate this? Yes, uh, uh, absolutely. So, 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 we, so, so we could have simulated uh, the, the the whole slide training to be similar to the uh, similar to the cell phone microscopy domain, or we could have we could have used a number of other domain adaptation methods in adapting this, right? But but we did not use any of those. So so, so we wanted to see what a crude model that's just directly trained on whole slide images adapts. How how does that adapt to the uh, the cell phone um, microscopy images? So we did not use any stain normalization or anything else in between. To, uh, to aid with the domain adaptation. And I think that there was one uh, uh, that relates to the nuclear segmentation. How to uh, solve the problem of overlapping cells between patches? Right, so, so overlapping and clumped uh, and chromatin sparse nuclei are a big issue with uh, when you're dealing with uh, nuclear segmentation. So we, uh, we generated a lot of synthetic data and the synthet synthetic data is guided by uh, having uh, these polynomial masks and that's where the, the nuclei becomes representative. So we generated a lot of synthetic data with overlapping and clumped nuclei, which helped. Um, however, it's still not perfect. So, so we do have cases where overlapping and clumped nuclei would be considered as, as one single entity. Can I ask a follow-up question on this, please? Mm -hmm. Can I please ask a follow-up question on this? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, so, sir, um, when, uh, like, the, in, the, in the case of nuclear segmentation, uh, when you are trying to get panoptic quality of, uh, uh, of your model, uh, when uh, like uh, one one issue that is commonly faced uh, is that the uh, IOU for that particular patch comes out to be uh, pretty uh, high, but when we are trying to uh, deploy the model across the entire WSI, that is uh, using like a sliding window or taking multiple patches, when the cells are uh, overlapping between two patches, that is half half of the cell is in one patch and half is in other uh, patch, so a double count comes. So uh, any idea like uh, any work on solving that problems? Um, no, we have not done that. So, so we we have not done nuclear segmentation on a on a whole slide level. But I I'm familiar with the problem that you're talking about. Yes, because uh, we are working on a patch level, right? So so there would be um, overlaps. So I mean I mean I mean you could have overlapping patches in a way to constrain this, um, but we have not worked on, worked on that yet. I'm referring to the uh, Hovernet paper that uh, you your lab came out with sometime. Uh, no, that's not from my lab. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I, I don't know about that, sorry. Yeah. All right, uh, 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 one more question. Uh, it's, I think this is a, more like a generic question. Is artificial intelligence aimed to make a final histopathological diagnosis, grading and prognostic factor prediction resulting in replacing the current histopathology, immunohistochemistry and molecular testing which are reported by pathology? Um, so yeah, the, 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 the short answer is no. So uh, artificial, artificial intelligence is not aimed at replacing any of those, uh, not at the moment at least. Uh, the, the goal really of what, what we're trying to do is to build some kind of assistive tools that would then help pathologists in making the diagnosis or doing this, doing this much faster. Um, uh, and there's, uh, as, as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, there's really a long way to go before these tools even get there. Yeah. All right, and uh, con continuation of the same uh, question. Um, is artificial intelligence an app or an instrument? Is the reporting by artificial intelligence in other body tumors in addition to ones you have mentioned? Can artificial intelligence be helpful in non-neoplastic conditions? Um, so it, it, it can be helpful with uh, anything that you have sufficient uh, data for. Um, 
Um, I couldn't understand what the other question uh, was. Okay, so let's, uh, let's repeat that. Uh, is artificial intelligence an app or an instrument? Uh, I guess that... Uh, yeah, it, 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 it could be both, right? So, so, so mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's generally, um, you, you need appropriate instrumentation for, for, for it to work. You need, you need appropriate computational power uh, to train these models. Uh, once they are trained, they can be deployed in, uh, in, in any situation. So they can be deployed on your cell phone. They can be deployed in a device that can then be used in a low resource setting where a pathologist might not be available. And um, a diagnosis that is only like 90% accurate is acceptable because any low resource settings where they don't have anything that might be uh, good enough. Um, whereas in... Um, in, in, in more developed situations, uh, AI would really be used as an assistive tool that would then be on your, uh, on your computer. It could also be on your cell phone. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then, is there any quality control system for artificial intelligence? What is the required micron thickness of slides for AI? Sorry, I couldn't understand that again. So is there any quality control system for artificial intelligence? What is the required micron thickness of slides for AI? Okay, so um, the, 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 the micron thickness and, and, and all, all of these things, if, if it's reasonably variable, your models will become robust to, uh, to, to those parameters. Uh, quality control, definitely. So as it becomes more dominant, quality control needs to be put in. Uh, there is work on using AI to, to, to quantify how fit the, the slide is for further analysis. So finding regions uh, that might be out of focus um, and things just like background that can then be used and, and lead to misdiagnoses. All of these, all of that work needs to be, needs to be done. And there are definitely labs that are working on those problems specifically. All right, and there is one last question. Uh, it is not entirely clear how to provide labels. Um, so there are many kinds of labels, right? So if you're dealing with this, uh, if you're training supervised models, you would need pixel level, patch level, or ROI level labels. What I really presented was using slides uh, and having like a slide level label. A slide level label can be anything that's in a pathology report. It's, it could be a diagnosis, um, could be a grade um, um, you, that, that, that you would then predict without um, annotating anything on the slide. So that's what's referred to as a slide level label. Um, all right, I think that uh, I see no more uh, posted questions. Uh, are there any more questions from the uh, audience? Hi, yeah, uh, I have a question uh, about how would the, the pathomic fusion work? How would the embedding of the histology image features into the, uh, the node feature vector of the graph convolutional network work instead of the attention gating that you proposed? So they, they, they both work together. So in the end, you just have like, a, like three feature vectors that, that, that then go into the, uh, in, into the tensor. Right, but uh, instead of uh, having the histology image, uh, learning from the histology image features itself, embedding the uh, f image features into the node vector of the graph convolutional network, will that be a possible approach? I mean, it could be, yes. Yeah, we haven't tried that. Okay, thank you. Hi, this, I have just one question. This is Sharif from uh, UNC. Uh, so the question is related to the nuclei segmentation process. So mm -hmm. basically, uh, it seems that I, I didn't really get the part of how the generative adversarial network did help in that procedure. Why did you need to create those fake images that, would, that eventually did help you to have a better segmentation? And mm -hmm. how would this process actually stand, um, uh, like again, something like the watershed algorithms for cell detections. Right. So uh, the reason we did this in the first place is because watershed and all, all the other classical approaches that, that don't, they, they don't work as well. 
um, they, they work in, in, in certain situations, but then they don't adapt to, to other situations. If we, if, if, we're, if we are going to use this to segment the nuclei and then build graphs on those, they, the segmentation needs to be reasonably accurate every time. Uh, and without without us having to go in and verify for each slide, and in, and in the end, if we're using uh, ten thousand regions of interests that, that that came from a slide, we don't want to go in and verify them. So we wanted a solution that's more accurate. Um, the secondly, so so the reason we synthesized so many uh, images, close to a million images, we we, we synthesized those because uh, to train. Um, one of these nuclear segmentation networks, you, 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 and, and for it to be really accurate, you need all, all, a lot of data, and we, it would have been much harder to annotate all of those images. And um, because the synthesis was based on a, uh, on, on, a um, on, on, on like a, a grid with, uh, with overlapping and clumped nuclei, we could place them in, in, in situations uh, that really stressed the training, uh, training process. Um, yeah, so it was just about data diversity. We could generate much more diverse data that then led to a model that was much better at segmenting nuclei. Thank you. Well, uh, if there are no more questions, then uh, I want to thank Dr. Mahmoud for the wonderful presentation. And uh, I'm pretty much sure that he will be available uh, offline for uh, answering some additional questions, if there are gonna be any. And uh, with that, uh, thanks once again for uh, attending this uh, talk. And uh, I, I wish everyone uh, a good day and, uh, and see you next time. Thank you.